Okay, so let's turn our attention then to some things from the scripture. As advertised, today we're going to talk about not so much about feelings. I'm not so much dealing with what particular feelings you might have, but how we deal with the feelings that we have. And I ask the question, who's driving? And for those that were in the adult lesson this morning, we talked about a lot of these things, and some some examples came up of, of people. I kind of made a, a list to myself that Jesus gets an A+, plus, right? He did a good job. Judas didn't do a very good job, right? What was his, what was his field of vision? And we're really talking about perspective here, right? What is our field of perspective? And how does that change with events? And in the last week, there's been a lot on the news about the Middle East, and there's been a lot in the news about the response to that here in the United States, and the different protests that are going on, and the different needs to uh, watch and watch out for different groups and gathering places that they were afraid that there might be violence as the Palestinians, as Hamas, called out for a, a day of rage. And think about that term and how that would fit with your understanding of what God wants us to behave like. And I'm not trying to take sides on this issue at all. I have my own sides on that issue. And I'll keep to myself. But what I want us to think about today, the reactions, the emotional reactions that are there today that weren't there that last week or a week ago or two weeks ago, why those fields of perspective change in us and how much control we might have over them. We talked about Job this morning. I mentioned Jonah. Jonah didn't do too good. Did God know he wasn't going to do too good? Yeah, but he sent him, and jo Jonah finally went and did it. In the end, he still had some, some bad attitude, right? Saul didn't do so good, but D Abraham did really good. How was Abraham's perspective field? How far was he able to think to the future? And we look at Hebrews 11, and it tells us that he was able to account that God was able to raise his son from the dead and was willing to sacrifice his own son to kill him. And God didn't make him finish that because the fact that he was willing to do it was enough for us to know that Abraham had that faith. Let's see if this thing works here. Oh, wow. Things to consider. And so I want you to be kind of cataloging these and thinking about them as we go through the references that we're going to read. I'm really going to only read from two chapters today, but we're going to read quite a few verses in them. Can you control your feelings? And the things that we're reading that Paul says in these two chapters, and one of them is going to be words to a church, and the other is going to be words to an individual, are these commandments. Does Paul know what he's talking about? Does Paul really get me? Okay? And I hope you understand what I'm saying here with these questions. Do these things apply to everyone? Is there a time when we can say, well, you just don't understand, Paul? Does Paul represent Jesus? And context, context, context. Don't forget the context in which Paul is saying what he says. Our first reading, Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So remember our, our list of things to do. Is this a commandment? Does Paul know what he's talking about? 
Is it possible to always rejoice? And earlier this morning, we read some words of Job when some horrific things happened to him, right? And his response was, I came out of my mother's womb without anything, and I'm going to go out of this life carrying nothing, and the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he didn't sin or accuse God of something wrongfully. Was he rejoicing? Well, it said he ripped his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped. But in the words, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord, I think we can see rejoicing. Let me stop here for just a minute and put some words in here. When a tragedy happens to us, it usually narrows our focus, right? And it's usually on me. It's, it's on the events that have happened. And during that time, we are quite often seeing the world through a keyhole if you know what I mean by that. Our field of vision gets very small and all we're looking at is this problem, why me? I, something has to be done to make things better right now. Right? And it's the pain of the problem that causes that. But after time and some introspection, introspection, We can more appreciate how God's plan is uh, covering a far greater perspective than what we can see through our pain. Some people have a hard time recovering from something tragic. Some, in some people I've found nearly everything in their life is tragic as they see it, as they perceive it. And I've had people that I have, have come to me asking for help, and I had to eventually walk away and say, there's nothing I can do, because I've told you what God has done for you, and they still just say, well, you don't understand, my life is bad. And, and I, I'm at a loss at that point. If, if you've told someone, here's the word of God, here's the promises given, Here's what you can expect. If they cannot broaden out that perspective, then I don't know what's to be done beyond that point. And so we get to verse 5. It says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, it's interesting to me that he says this, because some people, when bad things happen, they eat grouchy, right? A bad mood follows. Woe is me. Let me be miserable. And I find it interesting that he says, always rejoice and let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Now, is he just clueless? Does Paul not get it? And before you say maybe... Read all of his letter to the Thessalonians. Read what he says in 2 Corinthians 11 through 13, in which he will tell you some of the things that he went through. And I don't think most of us can claim anything close to what he went through. And yet he's the one saying, you need to pick yourself up and get on with having a good attitude. Be anxious for nothing, or don't worry about things, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and minds. He didn't say it's going to guard your left leg or someone near, near you dying. He didn't say it was going to stop that. He said it will guard. Can we think of field, or field of shield of faith? Can we think about that at this point? The same author said, put on the whole armor of God, right? That you may be able to withstand. He gets it. He's just saying, here are the tools. Here are the appliances that you need to deal with this. I would say that the shield of faith is what he's talking about here. The peace of God, which surpasses our ability to even understand it, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, he does say, not here, but in 1 Corinthians 1, he does say that the Spirit reveals the understanding to us. When he talks about things that we can't understand, he says, but the Spirit makes it known. And I would understand this to be the Spirit he's talking about that he's explained, he's given the details of what God will do, can do, and will do, so that we can cope. Okay? And of course, this leads us to the verse that we all like to think about on these things. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever... Noble is an interesting word. I'm not going to go into it today. Sometime on your own, look up the word noble and see if you can get a good definition and the etymology of it. Trace it back and see what it means. It, it, it has a, a broader meaning, meaning than what you might think. Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The old, the old King James, old Jimmy. We have new Jimmy and old Jimmy. And old Jimmy said, think on these things, right? The new one says, meditate. And meditate carries a little different idea for us, doesn't it? It means to maybe like spend some time not doing anything else but thinking about Right? Meditating is something we really don't want to do while we're driving, but we do want to think while we're driving. Okay. Maybe a slight difference there. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. So I would understand that to mean that Paul is saying, I lived this example for you. You need to observe the way I was behaving the things I was saying, the things I taught, and these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's really what we're talking about here is achieving peace, right? Being at peace when the rest of the world around us is not. And before we continue, a little story, and my siblings know this to be true, we lived a uh, couple hundred feet from a grandmother when we were growing up. And uh, she was pretty pragmatic about things. And when we would go over there moping about something, <laughs> which grandkids figure out that grandma's pretty good for that, we would go over to her, and if things weren't going well, we, we joked about it as kids, but I think back on it now, and I go, I know where she was going. She used to say, well, look at the pretty birds around you. Think about the butterflies and the flowers. Look at the flowers outside. Think about that. And I appreciate that now, especially knowing my grandma Ruby and how she lived and things that went on in her life. And that's kind of how she dealt with things. 
And that was different than the way that my parents dealt with them. My parents were known to say to me more than once, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. If you don't find something to do to entertain yourself or to get out of your little funk, I'm going to give you something to do. And I would usually disappear out the door, go find something to do. And it was amazing how fast as a kid that my problems would go away if I just went out and found something to do. I broadened my perspective, right? Okay. So he follows what, he just, what we just read. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So he isn't saying, you just stopped caring. He says, no, we were part. There wasn't anything going on that required any assistance from you. He says, now you, you've done something. And we're going to see, he, they obviously gave him some kind of gift, sent it to him. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. On a nice sunny day, this is easy. But on a day when someone's been taken away from us, or some things have been taken away, or life isn't going the way we want it, this is hard. And a lot can be read into the word state. In whatever state I am, to be content. That might be lacking food, clothes, money, friends. But that state might be lacking a limb, lacking the ability we used to have to move. There's a lot of things that it could be, right? And he says, I've learned to be content. And I think that's what we saw in the words of Job. That he said, I didn't make any of this. Anything I had, God gave me. It's his right to do with it what he wants, and what he expects me is to, to do is go, okay. He says, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So he isn't saying, deny what's happening to you. He isn't saying, don't admit that there's a problem. Ignore the problem. It's a state of mind. And in those verses before, go back here, down at the bottom, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Won't make your body whole again. Not yet. Other than that resurrection that we have hope in that gives us the peace of mind, right? But it's, it's the Spirit of God, it's the knowledge that God has given us that helps us do this. I didn't go far enough, did I? So he says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Be full, be hungry. Abound, suffer needs. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How does Christ strengthen us? And there may be a multiple answer to that, right? Can Christ do things for us now? Well, first of all, if we read carefully in the 16th chapter of John, Jesus says, I'm not the one doing it. He says, if you pray the Father in my name, He'll do it. Right? He said he sends, an, he sends another comforter, but he even says that is from his father. Right? And 
in, in, in understanding what he means by a comforter, I think we can find the solution to this. The Word of God is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is more than just the Word of God. Okay? If, you, if you envision a pie chart, okay, and you have a slice of that, that's the Word of God. But that slice is only a part of the Spirit of God. Another slice of that is the creation. Another slice of that is God's emotions, God's attitude towards whatever it might be, the things that are happening today, the things that have happened yesterday and, and will happen tomorrow. God's attitude about those are another slice of that spirit. It could be equated with creation when God said, right? God said, let there be, and there was. Second Peter 3 says, by the word of God, the earth which, right? And by the same word, the earth which now is, and by his word, the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness will come. That's all part of the Spirit of God. The power of His mind to think, to speak, and it happens. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Jesus said, the words that He spoke were not His, but His Father's. So, we can't expect Jesus to reach down with His right arm and fix our problems. I'm not saying he can't. I'm saying we can't expect it. Because Paul, the example we have, had all the, the torments that he had, people trying to kill him, people almost being successful in killing him several times. The shipwreck that happened, you know, that nobody wants to go through that, a terrible storm in the middle of the Mediterranean bit by snake, you know, the list is pretty long. So Christ didn't just reach down and save him, and eventually Paul was killed in Rome. But the power of salvation, the word of God that promises a better future, that's the strength. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving. Really? Concerning giving and receiving. But you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So he's saying, he's telling them, I've already learned how to, to handle my discomfort. I, I can be hungry, I can be full, and I still know where this is all going to end up. My field of perspective, he's saying, goes clear through the resurrection into the kingdom of God. He says, it was really great that you helped me. The, the love that you showed to me, I'm feeling it. I like it. It helped me. But he was looking for it more, not for what he was going to get out of it, but because of the blessings that they would give for helping him. How does that increase his field of perspective? And one of the kids in a class, <laughs> right, Akira? And I was not laughing at you, I was laughing with you this morning, that the idea that sometimes we have this little desire in us, right, to do what's good for us, what we want to do, and not for the other people. Isn't this the whole idea of love your neighbor as yourself, right? This is all just broadening the perspective.
continuing on, finishing this chapter. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. It wasn't that he didn't appreciate the gift. Obviously he did. And he, this was his way of saying thank you. But he was also saying good for you. Good for you. In, in every sense of that phrase, good for you. Thank you, and this is going to count to God for something. Okay. Now we move to the second reading. Now he's talking to a person. Timothy, man apparently younger than Paul that was traveling with him and teaching with him. Starts out, this is Timothy 6, verses 1 through 2 first. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. We have to think about that. What's, what's, what's the cause? What's driving Paul to say this? We work it backwards, we, we get the answer. He doesn't want God, the name of God, and his doctrine to be blasphemed. So he's insinuating, or outright saying, that if we don't have a good relationship, in this case, worker, boss, right, slave, slave owner, then people will see that and go, well, I thought you were Christian. Didn't I see the sign of the cross on your bumper? On your windshield? Verse 2, And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So he's telling Timothy, this is what you should be telling people as well. So remember our little deal there at the beginning, things I said to consider. Are these commandments? Is the, are these just suggestions that Paul has that we need to learn how to get along with one another? Even the people that we're locked in with that we can't really get away from? Because if you're a slave, You don't really have much say in the matter. And he's still telling you, remember that people are watching you, judging you based on your beliefs and your attitudes and your actions. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine of which accords with godliness, accords, agrees with godliness. Okay? Before I read on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to define this person, but before I read on, it says basically everybody has to teach this and consent to this. Because he says these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say this is the words of Paul. He says these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So by that, I would understand that Jesus told Paul this. He said, this is how you're supposed to, to behave and how the people you teach are supposed to behave. So if we don't do this, he is proud. Now, well, that's interesting. The first, first thing out of the blocks, pride. What is it? When we have bad things happen in our life and we say, I'm going to get that person or you just don't understand the problems I have, I don't have to quit weeping.
I'm, I'm just suggesting here at verse 4, he says, he's proud. Knowing nothing. What does that mean, knowing nothing? We were talking about our breadth of perspective. How far are we looking out if we are allowing our emotions to control us to the point where it's just about me right now? I don't have to think about the other people. But is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and dispute or destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. I'll deal with that last verse in a second, but in the last week, day of rage. And the protests that we see, not only do we see protests by the Palestinians, but we see people coming against them. Have you been paying attention to what's going on at Harvard? Have you heard about that? Where the college is saying, uh, first of all, what these people are saying, maybe I should have said, first of all, there's some Palestinian students there that are saying that Israel is totally to blame for everything that has happened. Don't look at Hamas. It's Israel's fault. And the United States should not spend another dime supporting Israel. And I'm not taking sides on this. What they do is what they do. We, we have to be careful that we remove ourselves, understand that we're looking for something completely different than they're looking for. But what we have to see, what I think it's wise that we observe is, at the moment the passions are high and people are saying things and other people are saying things back, and not just that, don't go back just a week, go back two weeks, two years. What's been going on in the United States, in the government? What's going on in the House of Representatives right now? Why at one point in time could they compromise and now they can't or won't compromise at all? What is their field of perspective? Could they fix it? Will they? That's a whole different question, isn't it? Verse 5, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Now, Paul is teaching Timothy here how to handle his own ministry and what to tell people, what to teach them. And when pride comes in, even in this room, and we're discussing something that we might have a difference on, the best thing we can do is back off, be quiet, think about it a while and then respond with love. Speak the truth. If someone doesn't hear you, I, I had a rule that I kind of had to apply to myself when I was working. The rule was, I'll say it once. <laughs> if I thought things were not going well on a job, or if my boss said, I want you to do it this way, if I thought that was a, an incorrect procedure, I would say once. And if he said, no, I want you to do it that way, I'd, okay. One time he wanted me to make a particular gear and he gave me the drawings that he had and he says, I want it this size. And I said, Mike, that won't work. That's going to cut clear through to the board and you're going to cut the gear in half. And he kind of turned red and said, that's how I want it made. And I said, okay. So I went, I put it in a lathe and I started cutting and when I got right to the point on the number on the, on the readout, I went and got him. Just before I cut it in half. And he said, you're right, thank you. But this, this idea of, you have to say the truth, right? But when someone rejects it, if, some, if someone, what, I'm not saying he was proud at the moment, I'm not saying he wasn't, but if someone isn't hearing you, how do we handle that? Is it, pride in us that says, no, you have to hear me now. And 
what really is accomplished by that? We get into this category, I think. And it's interesting, his last four words there in this verse. At least as this translation has it, last four words. From such, withdraw yourself. Yeah, there's a time to pull back. And go, you know what? This is not beneficial, me being in your face and you in mine. This is, this is not working. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain, and that is a huge statement. It's also a really difficult thing to pull off. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Does this mean that we never should try to improve our situation? I don't believe it means that for a moment. But it means that if you're unable to, you still say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? And doesn't this sound like what Job said? Next verse. For we brought nothing into this world and is certain we can carry nothing out. That's Job revisited by Paul. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But we'd like to have nicer food, and we'd like to have nicer clothing, and we'd like to have a nicer house. And it doesn't say that that's wrong unless... And this is where I was saying at the beginning, context, context, context. We have to be remembering all that Paul is saying when we're reading each clause here. It says, but those who desire to be rich. He doesn't say those that are rich. He doesn't say that. He says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now he states this as a fact. I believe he's right. That he knows what he's talking about. That the desire to be rich, not rich, but the desire to be rich can be a trap. Why? Verse 10, the love of money, not money, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And you go, well, why is he talking about all this with feelings? Because it's part of the context. It's just as much part of our feelings to desire to be rich and want to improve our life as it is the feelings we have when life goes against us. And it can be as much of a struggle when things are going good to have a broad perspective as it is when things are going evil or bad. So we are obligated to control both, right? But you, O oh man of God, okay, so he's talking to Timothy directly here, but I'm, he's already said the things I'm telling you, you need to tell other people. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Now these, these are all things that we seem, that we think are pretty basic, right? We think we have a pretty good grasp on these. And I'm not here to, to say you don't. I, I agree. These are all things that we kind of understand these words. But it's the application of this that's really hard. And it's that time when we are seeing life through a keyhole. When things are bad and we're going, woe is me, why me, why isn't it better? Get away from me. Stop telling me to, to quit moping. This kind of behavior. It says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you are also called 
and eternal life. This morning we mentioned in the adult class the fact that some people's perspective doesn't, doesn't include this, right? Or they have a, a very different view of what eternal life might be, and they think that we have to fix this world, the one we're in, which is interesting to me that we believe that we're going to live on this earth and we don't feel we have to fix it. Other people think they have to fix the earth, but they think they're going to leave it. I, it's, it's interesting to me. I just look at that and go, huh. I don't know that I have anything more to say about that. But reading on, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment. One of my questions was, are these things commandments? Does Paul know what he's talking about here? Does he understand me? Do you keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing? There's a lot we could say about that, too. There's the extent of it. That's the, the extent of our perception. Which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Just note about that. He says, we have to keep looking for the appearance of Christ, who God will make manifest. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that, that's the, the true extent of our perspective that we need to have, right? And that will modify everything that happens and all the feelings that we might have. Let's close with a song. Let's get number 159. Give me thy heart, number 159. <clears throat>
Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for your words that you have given us to tell of a more abundant life. We do leave our problems in your hand, Father, and we ask that you would strengthen us our, in our ability to keep looking to the future and keep looking to those things that are promised, that you would forgive us when we fail you, that you would be with all of your people that are trying to please you, that you would guide and protect and comfort and heal as fits within your plan and your love until the day that you send your son back. We pray for that day to be soon and for a place in your kingdom then. And we do ask these things in Jesus' name.